Okay. Yeah, everything's going good over here, folks. Um, I just copied the link to the live YouTube session over to Schoology, so that's available there for anyone looking for it. I'm uh, waiting on a pot of coffee to finish brewing downstairs, so I'll probably jump up and grab that in a little bit here. Um, but until then, I'm going to grab some stuff off of Schoology that I want to review. Okay. Good stuff here. Uh, Yoey Jow, yes. Um, I'm, that's the only time that I'm ever going to be doing direct instruction. Um, obviously you're welcome to do, uh, extra like studying on your own time anytime, but I just feel like Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 AM is nice and early. It gets it out of the way for me and for you. And, um, it's nice and consistent. It's kind of similar to the schedule at school in a way. Um, I don't know, it's just a good routine. Not even all teachers are doing online lectures. I'm just doing it because um, I think that that's what they pay me for. I don't know, that's just my philosophy. But um, So anyhow, yeah, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 a.m. And then for regular World History Kids, I'm going to start doing stuff at 10 a.m. after I get done with Euro. And then, yeah. Um, let's see here, Mochi, what are you doing? Okay. Get this set up. Good. The real question is, do I want hot coffee or cold coffee today? I think I might go cold.
<clears throat> so, um, do you guys usually wake up by this time anyway, or are you just uh, waking up for this and then going back to bed? Or maybe some of you haven't, uh, maybe some of you haven't slept at all. Maybe you're, maybe you're about to go to sleep after this and then wake up at 5 p.m. or something. Everything is better cold? I don't know about that. Lasagna? I would much rather have lasagna hot than cold. I woke up at 9 p.m. yesterday. Oh my god, Joey. Wow. What are you guys doing? You don't even have school as an excuse anymore. It, there's just no reason for this. You guys just do this because you normally do it. There's no... <laughs> I used to feel bad for you guys. Oh, I used, I'm stayed up until 4 in the morning. You guys just do it even when you don't have school. You were nocturnal before, as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to be right back. I'll grab some uh, coffee here, and then we'll get started. <laughs> 3 a.m. is a more ideal time to stream. Yeah, I'm sure so. <clears throat> Can we have a 24 hour stream? God, no. I don't want anyone watching me for 24 hours. Um, I should try a 3 a.m. stream. God, I, I, I don't even, I am not up at 3 a.m., kids. That's not a, that is not a healthy or normal schedule for a human being. 3 a.m. God, I'm in bed by 10. Are you kidding me? Well, it's good to have some contact with you guys. I feel like I've been stuck in the house for, well, I have been stuck in the house for a month. Hmm. All right. So, down here. That's better. Okay, so, um, we should do a Zoom call. No, here's the thing I, I know about Zoom. And I know what that does. And I, I think that they've updated some security stuff on there and so on. But 
I just find that Zoom introduces more liabilities than it solves problems. So it's just much easier to have it one way. I have control over, you know, what we see here and I don't want to, I don't want somebody to, you know, I don't, it's just seems weird having a phone call with a bunch of 10th graders on video. I just don't need to see you for me to do my job. So, um, so we'll just keep it one way. No tie today. No tie today. I, uh, I thought about putting one on, but then I thought, eh, that's the point. But, um, okay, well, I suppose we should get started here. Anyhow, um, let's go ahead and jump over to, okay, so today's lecture is going to be on, um, Today's lecture is going to be on the uh, review for unit three from our class, which was the age of exploration and age of discovery. And so today we're going to be talking about some major ideas from that period of time, uh, starting with Columbus, but also even before that, actually talking a bit about the Portuguese and where they go and some navigational technologies and things like that. And then also moving our way through all the way up until French and English colonization a bit later, talking about the significance of uh, Europe going over to the New World and kind of some of the social, political, and economic changes that this brings along with it, which, uh, so the age of exploration obviously completely changes the whole course of history because it's like discovering a whole side of the planet that the Europeans didn't even know was there. It's pretty amazing to think that this only happened 600 years ago in the grand scheme of things. It doesn't, mm, uh, for as modern as we like to think of ourselves, uh, the fact that we only discovered that the like other side of the earth exists 600 years ago is... Uh, pretty amazing not even 600 years ago closer to 500 years ago actually so pardon me let's go ahead and get started I'm gonna jump over um, to my desktop and we're gonna go over here and we're gonna open this up here uh, yeah we'll start with this this is from the um, this is from the College Board website. We've been using this already, but I just wanted to take some time to discuss some of the things that they talk about as illustrative examples. Some of the most important stuff is over here on the uh, side of the page. And um, close that one. And so just to talk about some of the technological advances, none of the, none of the age of exploration would have been able to happen without some very key technological advances that started in the age prior to um, uh, the age of Columbus and going over to the New World. Let me um, show you on, the, I don't know if you guys remember this PowerPoint. I bet you will when you see it. Let me go back to Schoology and pull this PowerPoint up so you guys can kind of um, see some of the things that we learned about when we were doing it in class. Let's go to here, no wait, yeah, that's right, here, PowerPoints, and then we're gonna download this one, Exploration. So some new advances from this time that they came up with, um, they list some on the side over here, like for example, the compass, stern post, rudder. We didn't talk about the stern post rudder, but that's just, it's. A rudder is a, it's kind of like a steering wheel for ships is the best way that I can um, think to describe it. Um, it's like a, um, it's, it's the thing underneath the ship that allows for the ship to be controlled um, using that giant like wheel and you can, you know, change the, change the course of the ship based on that. Portolani charts and things of that nature, new, um, new, new 
technologies. Check this out. Here's some of the here's some of the technologies. Actually, in the background here is a Portolani chart. In case you didn't know. Um, so uh, portal and charts, navigational maps based on compass directions and estimated distances. Now, of course, they didn't have all the distances figured out. They also didn't have all of the geography figured out. Remember that maps undergo a whole bunch of change during the next 200 years. From about 1500 to 1700, maps are undergoing some rapid, rapid advancements because they're learning more and more and more every year about cartography and um and the and the actual geographical landscape of earth so um they start making new navigational maps chip logs measured the speed of your ship in knots because you're feeling how many knots fall through your hand over a given period of time and that'll tell you roughly how fast your ship is going uh, they still use knots to measure ship speed today uh hundreds of years later Astrolabe, Mariner's Compass, Sextant, all of these are navigational technologies that allow for the, um, the explorer to know roughly where the position of the ship is on Earth's surface. Now, uh, when I say the position, I'm referring mostly to latitude. Longitude is di more difficult to measure. Um, you can measure the height where you are um, above or below the equator, okay, in terms of latitude. But longitude in terms of west and east placement, that doesn't get figured out until later with something called a chronometer, which was invented by uh, John Harrison was the guy's name. And so um, the, these, these, are, these predate the chronometer. So they first learned how to do latitude, later learned how to do longitude. Um, down here, you see the Latine sail. That's a triangular shaped sail up here that allows for them to sail into the wind uh, and reharness the wind to blow the wind back into the sails and still and still be moving them forward. So um, also the hulls that they started to build, clinker built hulls uh, and large rudders like we like I mentioned a minute ago to steer the ship as opposed to carvel built. How do they make it watertight? They use tar actually. Tar will keep all of the water out of the sh um, hull, the ship, the bottom part of the ship. Um, Portuguese navigation, there were a couple of big names in Portuguese exploration, Henry the Navigator, Bartolomeu Diaz, and Vasco da Gama. All three of them sailed, um, well, Henry the Navigator set up a, a school in Portugal, but Bartolomeu Diaz and Vasco da Gama both sailed um, like around the coast of Africa, and then Vasco da Gama all the way over to the coast of India. Remember that when we first started talking about the age of exploration, uh, it's the Portuguese that that ended up um, being the first to really go out and um, start setting up these trading post type settlements along coastal communities of Africa and India. And the reason the Portuguese did it, if you look at a map, is because um, it, like check out where Portugal is, right? They're all the way far west in Europe, right? And so they're the farthest away. You got to go through several different mountain ranges, one between France and Spain here. There's another mountain range in the Alps in northern Italy and Switzerland, and then you go through the Cauc Caucasus Mountains the further, uh, the further east that you go here. And, um, and so like there's several different mountain ranges that they would have to traverse in order to do land trade. Now, how come they didn't just engage in Mediterranean sea trade? Well, all of the Mediterranean ports are already spoken for, right? You've got um, you've got all of this is controlled by Spain. You've got southern France here. You've got Italy, the Italian city-states here. All are interested in pre protecting their trade. They have quite a monopoly on the trade of the Mediterranean at that time. And so you can't just get in and trade in ports that aren't yours. And um, by the time that ships coming from Constantinople or Turkey or even further east made their way across the Mediterranean, there was nothing left for Portugal to be able to get in on the action. So the way that they do it is they say, well, that's fine. We'll just go and we'll set up our own trading posts, but they don't go across the ocean because that is seemingly unnecessary. They, they go the simplest route, which is to go down. They keep along the coasts and they go down along the coasts of Africa, start setting up new trading posts here, all up the other side of Africa and even over into the coast of Italy after Vasco da Gama. Uh, these Portuguese settlers, um, 
would go there and um, set up these trading post type colonies without the intent of ever taking the lands over anything. Tiny little Portugal doesn't have an interest in that. They simply want to have access to a diversity of goods that they didn't before. Now, how come Spain ends up going over the ocean? Well, uh, similarly to Portugal, Spain isn't exactly ideally positioned either, and they're still a very far ways away themselves. And when Portugal goes down and starts setting up all of these trading posts down here, you might remember that Spain now doesn't want to step on Portugal's toes. So Spain says, well, that's fine. We'll find our own way to the other side, to the far east over here, by going around the ocean the other way. And that's when Queen Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon uh, end up commissioning Columbus, who, um, unlike most sailors of his time, thought that the Earth's circumference was actually about a third smaller than it was. And so when he uh, is hired, they are hoping against hope that Columbus's, you know, wackadoodle uh, worldview is actually correct, which, by the way, of course, it wasn't. And even on his third trip over to the New World, he still thought that he was landing in uh, somewhere in the in um, the Indian subcontinent or somewhere in you know maybe Southeast Asia perhaps or something like that but anyhow um, so this is how things get set up early now of course if you remember the future of this story the, a lot of these Portuguese ports that got set up here along the coast of Africa and even over into India they down the line end up getting taken over by the Dutch and the Dutch take over the Portuguese trading set settlements and then eventually after the Dutch, the English largely take over most of these settlements after the Dutch Golden Age uh, expires. So here's Columbus. Obviously, uh, we don't really know. Whoa, where's my thing here? Okay, we don't really know what Columbus looked like. This is just an artist's rendition of him. But September 9th, 1492, set sail across the ocean. Uh, 33 days it takes him to get to San, what is modern day San Salvador or El Salvador. Uh, San Salvador is the capital. And he lands on October 12th, Columbus Day. But nowadays, we don't really celebrate Columbus Day because it just seems a little bit Eurocentric, I guess. And mistakes it for the East Indies and Japan. Doesn't even realize till his third voyage. Um, friendly natives, uh, who he calls Indians, provided corn, yams. Uh, there, there are interrelations between the Spanish settlers and the Native Americans, some of them forced some of them not forced um and so the i you know the the spanish settlers who came over were largely male and so they had been um they had been uh, you know these explorer type guys who just didn't you know they didn't necessarily have families they came over and um, because of the large male population of settlers that come over, similar to actually the early story of the English, when the English first start settling in Chesapeake Bay Colony, not Massachusetts Bay Colony, Massachusetts Bay Colony attracted families, but in the early, early days of English settlement, when they would go to uh, Jamestown and stuff, it was mostly men who, who made the voyage across the ocean, not women. And so there's a huge population disadvantage there, and this results in a rise of things like violent crime and so on. Even in modern times, um, when there haven't been enough women, um, you see an increase in, in things like rape and, and stuff like that. Um, for example, in China, there was a policy for a long time where people could only have one kid. Um, which, you know, wouldn't necessarily be an issue unless there were sexist um, policies that uh, or sexist social attitudes that basically meant that boys were more important than uh, girls to have as kids because boys of inheritance laws and other things like that. And what ended up happening in China is um, you had a disproportionately large number of men to ratio of males to females and um, we saw an increase in things like violent crime and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I don't think that it's unique to Columbus that this sort of thing happened. I think that anyone in Columbus's position uh, would have done probably more or less the same things back, especially back in those times. Um, I don't think that he's an extraordinary historical figure, um, kind of a sad one, maybe in some ways, but uh anyhow this is the sort of thing that that goes on and uh 
as much as they were looking for gold in the New World, let me tell you one thing that they did not find was gold. Now, the Spanish did find a bunch of silver in the New World, but um, uh, that and that's going to cause its own problems with the European economy, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. Amerigo Vespucci is the guy who America eventually gets named after because he's the one who kind of realizes, like, hey, this is in India. Um, so uh, the, you can see here this whole transfer of goods uh, is the Colombian exchange which we talked about that's another major aspect of this unit is the Colombian exchange you should know at least a few things that come over from Europe would be things like cattle horses pigs which by the way was so it's like an ecological nightmare that they just brought these animals over and they just basically set them free into the countryside like they're, you're introducing a bunch of foreign invasive species and it's like here just have all of these nature and see how that goes you know like they're lucky it didn't turn into total catastrophe. Well, I guess it did in some ways with like, you know, the Atlantic slave trade and stuff like that. But um, it's it's pretty amazing that like this is uh, this period of time. It's it's really um, it's just kind of chaotic in a, in a weird way. It, it, what can you say about it? All right, let's. Um, I actually forgot to jump back over to the other thing. So here, let's see. Um, let me let me jump back over here. That way you can kind of see what I've been talking about. I just forgot to switch the screen back over. Here we go. All right. Uh, where are we at? Let's do this. Oh, wait. It's here. Okay. So in case you're wondering, like, this is some of the stuff that I've been talking about here. Um, here you can see the... Portolan charts in the background here. You can see uh, the Latin sail that I was talking about a moment ago. Here you can see Vasco da Gama, Bartolomeu Diaz. And then the map that I was referring to is right here. So if you look down here, uh, this is all the areas in which the um, Portuguese settled. Uh, and then eventually their lands during the Dutch Golden Age were largely taken over. These trading posts that were established by the Portuguese get taken over by the Dutch. Here's Columbus. Here's the Colombian exchange. Cattle, horses, pigs, wheat, rye. Smallpox is a big one because smallpox decimates the Native American population to the tune of about 90% of the people die from smallpox and other illnesses. What, bring, what gets brought over from North America, the New World, to the Old World? Well, corn, potatoes, tobacco, beans, squash, peppers, cocoa, and then um, syphilis was the only um, disease that was really transferred from Native Americans to Europeans. Pretty much all the other diseases were transferred from Europeans to Native Americans. A lot of people think that sugar was something that originated in the New World. It is not. Sugar was brought over from the Old World to the New World. Um, and remember, there are other things, too, that you could say, like tomatoes and other things like that that get brought over to Europe. Um, so that gives you an idea of the Colombian Exchange. Uh, this was where this um, map here. Let me see if I can blue this one up a little bit more. This map here is one where um, it shows you where the Portuguese claims are along the coastal regions of Africa and the western coast of India. Even this tip here where modern day like Yemen is, um, or United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, uh, this, this, this region right here uh, was settled by the Portuguese originally. And then they also settled down here in Brazil. But because they started settling in these regions, the Pope steps in and it's like, hey, we've got two Catholic kingdoms here who could potentially step on each other's toes over in the New World. So remember, the Pope draws this line here called the Treaty of Tordesillas line. line. And what this Treaty of Tordesillas line does in 1494 is it says all territories west of that line would go to Spain. So Spain actually has far more lands than, than Portugal, <clears throat> Portugal does in the New World because at the time in 1494 when the Pope addresses this issue and draws this line, uh, they really had no idea how much land there was still far to the west. Um, keep in mind that some of them didn't even know they had reached a new place yet. So this was a whole unexplored region of the globe that, um, that the Pope was kind of just by way of arbitrariness 
uh, just like putting this line here to say, okay, we don't want Spain and, and Portugal to go to war with one another over lands that they should both be trying to Christianize over here in the New World. Now, remember that the three major motivations for going to the New World were the three Gs, God, glory, and gold. The Spanish um, had the very forceful way of kind of going about uh, conquering places and then moving on, conquering Christianizing places and then moving on uh, to others. And we talked about the requirement that they would read to people this giant scroll in Spanish to the to the Native American populations there. So anyhow, that's that. Uh, moving on, moving on. Uh, consequences of exploration. Spain went on to set up the encomienda system. Remember that, um, I'm kind of jumping all over the place here. Uh, consequences. Okay, so Spain went on to dominate for three centuries in the New World, uh, but, but these become, become exped expeditions, expeditions of conquest. conquest. They're, They're looking, looking for wealth, but they, and they, they do get some, mostly silver. There's a little bit of gold that they get, but not much. And, and this, of course, finances Spain's role in the religious and political wars in the 16th and 17th century, which we're about to face with the Protestant Reformation, which is what we covered at the end of last week. New fruits, vegetables, animals, also new illnesses. Um, the Aztecs were the largest and most advanced of the Native American civilizations. They had advanced trade routes and communication um, things and so on. And um, so... Hernan Cortez um, is the guy who's credited with kind of um, bringing together several different Native American uh, tribes who had previous beefs with the um, Aztecs and together along with the combined efforts of smallpox uh, was able to take out most of the uh, Aztec civilization in a short period of time. It's not due to military genius. It's not due to technological advancements. It's not due to organizational skills. It is largely credited to the role of smallpox and the inability of Native Americans who, in comparison to the Europeans, were largely quite clean people um, and more hygienic and also did not live amongst filthy animals for centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, that uh, that the Spanish or that the uh, Native Americans were not able to defend themselves against this um, terrible uh, illness uh, epidemic that was going through of smallpox at the time. Um, <coughs> The Spanish also end up destroying the Inca civilization down in Peru, and that's thanks to Francisco Pizarro, who landed near Peru with about 200 men. And Atahualpa was the Inca ruler at this time, and uh, he lured him into a conference and seized him, killed hundreds of his followers, denied his ransom efforts, and ended up killing him in 1533. And the Spanish continued fighting these, uh, these conquering-style um, conquistador style battles all the way through uh, the mid 15 late late 1500s uh, Christianity in the New World conversion was seen as a major factor uh, God glory gold so they're going over they are trying to com uh, convert folks you guys probably learned something about missions growing up in uh, California uh, the Spanish who settled in California and also in all areas throughout Central and South America uh, set up several different missions uh, to civilize and Christianize uh, the areas of the globe that had not yet been expo uh, exposed to, uh, to Christianity. Um, now, one of, what about the economic side of things? Well, when Spain goes over, remember they set up the encomienda system. The encomienda system was a way of um, basically enslaving the Native American population. Now, Native Americans, uh, when we talk about Native Americans, it's really tough to talk about Native Americans in, in history because uh, the natural way that you are uh, tempted to talk about Native Americans is as some sort of like um, whole group or something like that. But Native Americans made up a huge number of different types of peoples. and. Um, so calling them all one group of Native Americans is really not historically accurate and it's not really very useful for contextualizing 
what happens because different Native American tribes have different experiences, although I would say all of their experiences in one way or another are affected by, number one, disease, of course, smallpox, but then all of them are, are influenced in some way or another by, um, by the economic systems that the Europeans get put into place with uh, plantation-style farming and other things like that when they come into the New World, they're setting up plantations for the extraction of raw materials, namely crops. Um, and that could be food crops, but it could also be non-food crops, like uh, the English set up tobacco plantations and things. And then, of course, later on down the line, when you get to the 1800s, which is quite a ways later, you have um, cotton, and that becomes another major non-food crop. But it doesn't matter. It's all crops. It's all agriculture, and they're trying to extract mass amounts of goods. Now, why were they doing that? Well, that's rooted to another major concept of this unit, which is mercantilism, right? So I think we should take some time to review what mercantilism is just for the sake of um, safety. Uh, on the AP exam, in case you get asked anything about mercantilism, it might be kind of good to know something about it. Um, so mercantilism is an economic system that dictates old school European thought. And the way, that, uh, the way that mercantilism works in comparison to, say, capitalism is that with capitalism as an economic system, first of all, capitalism is intrinsically tied to freedom. And so you have a lot of choice to pursue self-interest in, uh, in a capitalist economy. In a mercantilist-style economy, you really have very little self-interest. Uh, most of the things that you're doing when you engage in the economic system of mercantilism is either directed to you from your social superior above because we're still in a highly feudal European political situation at this time where people have very deliberate uh, order of being in which they uh, believe that there's, uh, there's social um, superiors like nobles and clergy and other folks like that who are above you in the social system and if they, whatever they say goes, you can't just <clears throat> go and do whatever you want in the mercantilist system. You don't have a lot of self-interest. You're actually quite stymied. You're quite controlled uh, by the social powers that be. Uh, another major difference is, uh, aside from not having a whole lot of liberty in mercantilism, is that, um, is that with mercantilism, it's very oriented towards uh, what you might call imperial-style economies. So, <clears throat> what is an imperial style economy? Well, you have to just think about what these empires were trying to do when they went over to the New World. Right? They're trying to expand the amount of stuff that they have to sell. Now, in mercantilism, it, the, hum, the fundamental belief about wealth in the mercantilist system is that wealth is limited. So everybody is fighting for the same size pie of limited amount of wealth on Earth's surface. And of course, the only thing that they thought brought any real wealth at that time would have been things like gold and silver and bullion. Bullion is a fancy word for metal, precious metals. Um, and so when the, uh, when the Europeans start setting up plantation-style economies, it's because their their belief in this limited amount of money being circulated around means that you want to get the largest slice of that limited amount of pie you know imagine you show up at thanksgiving you have one giant pumpkin pie from costco sitting on the table for your whole family of like 30 people or whatever okay so you got 30 people over at your house for thanksgiving You've got one pie. Everybody's going to want the largest slice of that pie. They, they want the largest slice possible. That's how the Europeans view wealth at this time. They want to have the largest cut of the, of the amount of money that they can on Earth's surface. And when I say money, of course, once again, I'm referring to gold and silver at this time. I'm not talking about paper money, which at this time is viewed as worthless. No one really used paper money unless it was for like IOU purposes or whatever. So when the Europeans put up these plantation style economies, it is a function of trying to grab the largest slice of pie. Mr. Knight, I don't get it. How does setting up a plantation mean that you can have access to a larger slice of pie? Well, it has to do with what you can sell. The only way to get money is to sell stuff, okay? There's no like, you know, 
if the way that I get money as an individual is different than when I'm talking about it in this time. Okay, we live in a capitalist style economy. There's goods and services. There's a lot of self-interest in modern day times. They didn't have any of that. There was no consumer style economy back in the 1500s. Or very, it was very limited. They did have some consumer goods. I shouldn't say there was none. But it's not like today where you can just show up at any place and buy yourself a bottle of Windex or whatever. It's just different times. So countries had to find stuff that they could sell to other countries. And this trade imbalance is, what, is why imperial style economies are so tied to mercantilism. The whole idea of why Spain wants to set up sugar plantations in the Caribbean is because sugar is a hugely, hugely, hugely sought after good globally. Everybody wants sugar. Sugar makes your food taste better. And food is an essential part of living. So sugar is a highly, highly, highly demanded product. And if the, if the Spanish make a whole bunch of plantations that make sugar, now the Spanish have a valuable good that they can trade to gain a bigger slice of that limited amount of wealth that's on Earth's surface. So what happens is that other, other European powers say to themselves, you know, we want to set up plantations as well so that we will have a diversity of goods to sell with one another. And this is where we really start to see the beginnings of a global economy because these European nations in Europe, they're small. Spain is small. Portugal is small. And there's only a certain amount of stuff that they're going to be able to grow. There. There's only so much arable land on Earth's surface. And there's even less arable land when you start cutting our surface into kingdoms. And, and you say, well, what can England grow? And it's like they can grow sheep. That's like one of the things that they'll grow. They can grow some wheat. But remember in the 14 and 1500s, they hadn't come up with a lot of those irrigation technologies yet for the agricultural revolution. So England can't grow stuff like pepper, like black pepper on food. So pepper becomes an, an asset that only super, super wealthy people would have even been able to afford. And so these, these people uh, are looking to set up economies in different places around the globe to have more stuff to sell. And that's where mercantilism comes in. The other thing about mercantilism, too, is it pits, it pits the, the European powers against one another as competitors. And so it becomes difficult to negotiate the terms of imperialism because you have people who are kind of trampling on each other's lands in the new world and you got to be careful of that because that could instigate a war uh, that would extend back to, to Europe, which has happened, of course, with the Seven Years' War and other things like that. So uh, that's, that's mercantilism. But then you've got the other side of it, which is the Native Americans and how they fit into the whole thing, So, that, <clears throat> which is how this whole conversation got started in the first place. So. We talk about the Native Americans, of course, they're on the bad side of things because as these Europeans are kind of like ruthlessly setting up these giant plantations in the New World, they realize that the plantations that they're setting up are very labor intensive. You know, there are some plantations where you can save money using animals, okay? Like there are some, there are some um, farming endeavors where land, animal would be a labor saving device, but not for the kinds of plantations that they're going to start setting up. Sugar, in particular, is hugely, hugely, hugely labor-intensive. It's, it, it's, it, there, you can't just have a cow do the work to, do, to make sugar. It takes somebody going through really thick um, sugar cane fields and chopping it down with a machete, and you've got to like carry it all back, but then you've got to like process the sugar, and there's a million different steps. to Before you see the granule sugar that you put in your coffee or whatever... Okay, that granule sugar, that crystallized granule sugar, doesn't just come off of the doesn't it doesn't just come off the cane that way. You have to process it, and it's very labor intensive, and there's it's backbreaking labor, and it's really gruesome, and it's hot, and it's humid, and it's just terrible. So uh, they needed people to do this form of labor, and they originally the Spanish tried to set up this encomienda system where or did set up the income in the system where the Native Americans were forced into labor, but it was really, really, really brutal and as, as only slave labor can be. 
And uh, so mining, agriculture, Caribbean use of slaves, slaves was intense, but the main export is sugar. And it's making them just a boatload of money because sugar is so highly sought after uh, in all parts of the world, but especially in Europe where their food is really bland. And so labor servitude in Comienda system was a formal grant of the right to labor of a specific number of Indians dependent on how much wealth you had and how much land you had. Land is, of course, intrinsically tied, tied to wealth at this time. Uh, the repartimiento system replaces, to some extent, the encomienda system, but it's most, mostly just the same thing by a different name. It required adult male Indians to devote a certain number of days of, of labor annually to Spanish economic enterprises. And so while they weren't permanently forced into labor under the repartimiento system, it's not as though... It's a benevolent system. It's still, uh, it's still crudely uh, utilizing the, the indigenous populations for labor, uh, forced, forced servitude, and it's backbreaking, terrible labor. And you can see some of the sugar cane down here that they're processing. Um, you can see this is this very labor intensive uh, process back here, but this is the process of making sugar in the back. Now, um, here's the thing about, uh, here's the thing about, oh, wait, I forgot to switch it over. Here you go. Here's the, here's what I was just talking about. So, whoops, man, this thing is so like laggy when you roll the, okay. So here is, here you can see, right? The encomienda system in action, putting Native Americans to work. And then this is what I was talking about with the sugar cane down here. And you can see them processing it over here. Here's a giant like kettle where they're boiling. And then over here, you can see them processing it in the background. It's a giant, it's quite, it's quite a lot of labor and it's really grueling labor. And especially in this time. Now, of course, here's the other thing that I was going to mention to you guys. Why is it that African slaves end up replacing Native Americans. Well, there's a few different reasons for this. Number one reason has to be that Native Americans, as much as the as much as the Europeans, Span Spaniards, but others too, would have loved to utilize Native Americans for slave labor. Uh, the reason that it ends up not working out is because so many Native Americans die to illness, and so it's really you can't. I mean, it's just. It's something that they can't control. The, the Native American populations are dying to the tune of 90% of the population. I mean, it's a, in tr just a tremendous number of people who are losing their lives. And so, and if you're dead, obviously you're not gonna make a very good laborer. And so um, they end up having to look for labor sources from other areas. Why Africa? Well, similar to the Caribbean, Africa is largely a, a tropical climate. And um, due to being in the tropics, uh, one of the things about the tropics is that it's very difficult to keep livestock alive in the tropics. And um, Africa had not seen the kind of changes that Europe had seen going centuries back. Where increasingly in Europe, where they had used slaves back in the ancient Roman and ancient Greek times, slaves had been largely replaced in Europe by by animals, animals, and which is why the Europeans had so many illnesses in the first place is because they had lived amongst animals for so many centuries and the animal born illnesses eventually will jump over and evolve. And, and that's how you get things like avian flu and bat disease and all the rest of it. Anyway, uh, the Native American population, uh, excuse me, the uh, African population in the tropics down in Africa didn't take on the same um, the same labor saving devices via animals because animals will die in the tropics uh, due to all sorts of different illnesses that are spread by insects and things. The tsetse fly, for example, is an insect that um, that spreads something called sleeping sickness. And if you try and have a you know livestock like cattle, um, it'll kill your whole livestock. Uh, all, every single last one of them will be dead within a few weeks if sleeping sickness is introduced and the flies are always around cattle and so it's always inevitable, in, an inevitability that your livestock are going to die. 
And so uh, they, so whereas in Europe, animals replaced slaves for the most part, um, in Africa, we don't see animals replace slaves. And so c from a purely um, ruthless capitalistic standpoint, the Europeans are looking for a very deliberate asset, slaves. Okay, they're looking for a particular commodity uh, in slave labor. And just like sugar or coffee beans or tobacco or sheep or whatever, okay, there's only certain places on the globe in the Europeans' day where you can find abundant numbers of slave labor. And that was in Africa because Africa had continued to utilize slave labor on a scale uh, on a scale wide enough where the Europeans would be able to go and trade stuff that they had, whether it be raw materials or molasses or rum or finished products that were made in guilds and other things like that up in Europe. And they would bring these goods down to Africa, trade them for, for the commodity that they needed to make more of that stuff, which was slaves, and then bring those slaves over via the Middle Passage to uh, Central uh, Central and South America, but also North America eventually. But the vast ma majority of slaves go to Brazil. The vast majority of slaves that make the Middle Passage, that come over from Africa over to the New World, go to the West Indies, which is going to be the Caribbean, and then they go to Brazil. Those are the biggest places where slavery uh, from Africa came. However, in America, we had millions and millions of slaves. Only 400,000 slaves came from Africa to North America. In the grand scheme of things, that's a relatively small percentage that actually make the voyage over to North America from Africa. So where do all of the millions and millions and millions of slaves from American history come from? Well, they largely came from natural reproduction. So that's why when we think about um, um, African American as an identity or black Americans as an identity. Um, it's, an, it's an identity that was built largely um, from people who were raised for generations and generations and generations. African Americans were raised in uh, America and they weren't brought from Africa and then forced into labor here. It was, a, it was an American culture. And so when we talk about um, when we talk about, like, for example, what happened in Liberia, where the African Americans who had been liberated from slavery were sent back to Africa, even though they weren't going back anywhere since they were born in America, um, they, they get sent to Liberia and they promptly then enslaved the Liberian population there, which was uh, obviously really, really bad. So um, you see an entirely new culture, amalgamate culture, develop. Um, in America thanks to natural reproduction of slaves in America. Um, but from the European standpoint, it's no different than any other commodity. They're simply trading for a good, which is of course really weird for us in modern times to think about because, um, you know, slaves are human beings, they're people. And so, uh, but they, they were treated very, very, very poorly. And of course the Atlantic slave trade goes on a good long time and we don't even see the end of slavery uh, or the, the end of the slave trade technically is outlawed in about 1808, somewhere in that neighborhood, 1807, 1809. I'm, I might be getting the year off by a hair, but it's right in there. It's within the first decade of, um, of the 19th century. And the British at that time start using the British Royal Navy to crack down on the slave trade. Now, I will add on this that, um, that um, although the British do crack down on the slave trade, technically slavery goes on in America for another 60 years or so after that, because we don't see the end of slavery in America until the end of the Civil War in 1865. So um, it's not that even though the slave trade gets outlawed, slave trade does still happen. Um, but if you were caught doing it by the British Royal Navy, you were essentially hanged on sight because it was punishable by, by death and it was an extremely... Um, bad it was like really 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 bad super 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 illegal okay because it's essentially it'd be the same as like you know human trafficking or something today maybe even worse to be honest with you so um so anyhow that's that's kind of the story on on the slave trade let's jump back over here i wanted to 
I wanted to cover a few other things before we jump over to some other stuff. Uh, mostly, here's another major feature of what happens in the um, in uh, in the wake of Spanish exploration of the New World. Spain starts bringing all the silver over to the New World. Um, remember that during this time, the Spanish control the Low Countries, and the Low Countries are going to be the Netherlands, which is like the what becomes the Dutch Republic, but also later on what becomes Belgium and Luxembourg. And so those territories are controlled by Spain. They're the most important territories that Spain controls at the time. All right, so income from American colonies never accounted for more than 10% of Spain's total income. Most of their incomes came from the Spanish Netherlands, which was this huge, huge, huge trading post. So although the Spanish silver was important, it's, not, it's something to mention, you got to remember that the bigger economic story for Spain isn't even the silver that they're bringing from the New World. It's the Spanish Netherlands. It's, 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 it's the Dutch Republic, which they are about to lose control over because increasingly the Dutch Republic is going to uh, challenge Spanish authority there because culturally they are Dutch, they're not Spanish. And also, uh, religiously, they are a product of the Protestant Reformation, and Spain remains very Catholic. So you now have a religious pluralist uh, divide between the Dutch Republic and the Spanish uh, Habsburgs as well. Uh, wine, oil, grain, shoes, clothing, wool, all of these were products Spain traded to France and Italy via the Spanish Netherlands. So the Spanish Netherlands, those ports, if you look at a European map again, all right, if we go back up here, you know what? I'm just going to do this because this is so stupid. Okay, if we jump up here to, where are we at here? Let's jump over here. All right, you can see it a little, little bit here. It's not the greatest map, but it, it, here's Spain and Portugal, right? The low countries are all the way up right over here where my arrow is, okay? Kind of above, between the A and the N of France, kind of right in this region right here, okay? But right above the N, roughly. And this region here is going to be, you know, what becomes the Dutch Republic, what becomes Belgium, and so on. These territories are huge, huge, huge ports. You've got Amsterdam up here. You've got Antwerp up here. Those are Spanish ports at the time, at the end of the 14th, start of the 1500s. And, um, and the, these territories are going to be an asset to Spain's economy because all of the best trading happens right up here in Northern Europe in those ports, particularly though at Amsterdam. But as time goes on, they are going to culturally break away. They will actually wage a war and eventually win their independence as well from Spain. So that's where you get the independent Dutch Republic. Now the Spanish Netherlands, Belgium, um, uh, stays part of the Spanish uh, Netherlands for a long time and it, Belgium doesn't gain their independence until quite a few years later in the 1800s I think um, uh, 18 I think eight it's like one of the revolutions of that comes right before 1848 is uh, the Belgian one so anyhow okay so Spain Philip II is the king of Spain at this time uh, one of the products, byproducts of bringing in all of that uh, wealth over to the new world, um, or over to the old world from the new world rather. So all of this silver that the Spanish are taking over to, this is the triangular trade map, by the way, in case you're wondering what we're looking at here. We were talking about that a minute ago. But all the wealth that the Spanish are bringing over in the form of silver to Europe, remember that Europe, because of the mercantilist economy, um, you know, they had not seen any new wealth in circulation for centuries in Europe. And so when the Spanish take and dump a boatload of silver over boatload after boatload of silver into the European economy, what happens is that the price of silver falls out, right? Because all of the, um, all of the, uh, I'll answer that question in a minute there, Din Din. I just saw it right now. But um, all of the wealth that the Spanish were bringing over, you know, if, it's like anytime you, if you were to take a bunch of diamonds and then just dump them into the open market, the price of diamonds is going to crash, right? Because, 
now there, there's way too many diamonds available and and their scarcity goes down same thing happened with silver and the inflation in europe goes up there's this huge price revolution that happens in europe where prices are sky high and it takes more and more silver to buy the same stuff and so for a while there actually the spanish influx of silver into the new world actually wreaks some economic problems on europe they they really struggle with inflation for a while there and that's where the dutch really come in and start thinking to themselves you know hey we can take advantage of this merchant shipping business because if we can store stuff and wait for the prices to come back up on goods uh, we can make a profit by storing grain and other things like that waiting for the market to change and then selling it for a profit so the dutch become very 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 good at merchant shipping and they they use their ships to um, trade on behalf of other of other um, um, imperial powers at the time and end up taking some of the wealth for themselves and developing rather quickly I think I've said it many times in class pretty much all the greatest ideas that the British ever had the Dutch came up with them first and were it not for the Dutch position next to France uh, during the years of Louis the 14th where he waged war after war against the Dutch and then also the English waged wars against the Dutch as well with the Anglo-Dutch wars um, the Dutch probably would have ended up becoming a really powerful global global power but unfortunately due to their geography their situation next to France and their relatively small size um, they were not able to stay on on top for very long after about 1680 or so now, Dindin asked a question, what was the Aztecs' first reaction to the arrival of the Spaniards? To be honest with you, if I was to guess, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Um, what was the Aztecs' reaction? My guess is probably that the Aztecs were not overly impressed with the Europeans. If it was, if it was up to me, I would guess that they were not at all threatened by the Europeans when they showed up. The Aztecs had been around for a long time. They had been, established themselves as the dominant power of the Native Americans. They had thousands and thousands of square miles of terrain that they had, uh, according to, to them, that they had taken over. Um, not to say that there weren't other local tribes that didn't like the Aztecs, but they are the preeminent power in the Yucatan Peninsula at that time. And my guess is that a couple of hundred you know, Spanish settlers showing up and, and rattling a few sabers probably didn't scare the Aztecs too much. Um, that would be my guess. That's, that's just simply my guess. I would assume that they probably didn't think much of the Europeans at all. But, of course, when, when disease starts killing people to the tune of, you know, 90%, well, now all of a sudden you, you have a different thing on your hands. But it's not, you know, even then at that time they knew that it wasn't necessarily, they knew that the Europeans were bringing illness over, but then there's a, you know, they're living in a superstitious time. So they don't know if it's an angry God that's causing this. They don't know if it's bad, evil spirits that are causing this sickness. They don't have ideas that, you know, microscope doesn't get invented until, I don't know, 15, 20 or something like that, maybe even later. And um, so, you know, I don't, I, it might be even later than that. I, I have no idea when the microscope was invented, but um, was it, who was that, Leeuwenhoek, father of microscopy? Who, who, who let's see here. Let's take a look at who that is. Microscope invented. Oh, it's Janssen, Zacharias Janssen. That's who it was. And he invented it in 1590. Okay, so they don't have, they don't even really have an idea of um, like microbes and stuff like that. So, you know, who knows? <clears throat> they knew that diseases were communicable but they didn't really know why they were communicable. They certainly didn't have any idea of like vi viruses or bacteria or anything like that. But um, I don't think that the Aztecs really saw it coming, to be honest with you. I, I think that the Aztecs were pretty surprised. The amount of time that it took the disease to kill people was really short. We're talking within a century, 90% had died, not over the course of four centuries. Over the course of one century, 90% of people died. That is, that is, um, I mean, the pandemic that we're all facing right now is, is nothing. I mean, it's, a, it's nothing compared to 
to the, the effect that smallpox had on the Native American population. So um, I, I just think that, uh, I think that probably the Aztecs really had no idea what they were dealing with, to answer your question. All right. Well, let's jump over here back to the desktop and um, take a look at this review sheet here just to remind you of a few major ideas. So here you have uh, gold. They wanted to bypass those Arab monopolies. The, the Muslims had taken over all of the Middle East and the religious uh, problems at the time dictated that Christians and Muslims, excuse me, had not gotten along for a long time, and uh, they hoped to find precious metals abroad. Uh, abroad, of course, they want to spread Christianity to the indigenous cultures, and then too, there's a, there's an aspect about sorry, there's gardeners that are mowing lawns outside. Uh, they want to. They, they had read literature about the New World. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They're eager to remember all the land in Europe is accounted for, and they find basically this huge amount of land over there that, according to the European mindset, they have no understanding of how the Native Americans conceptualize of land. And the Europeans conceptualize of land and, and land acquisition and land usage in a very different way than the Native American populations did. And so uh, the glory part of it is like making a name for yourself, going over, maybe making a military name for yourself, conquering people, but also, you know, maybe even setting up your own plantation or, or taking over lands to call your own and make a name for yourself as a new world noble of some sort. Uh, so the glory side of it is, is definitely a big aspect of it as well. Improvements in navigation and ship design. We talked about that. Uh, Spain, Portugal, Netherlands, England, and France, where do they eventually settle? Well, uh, keep in mind that they don't all settle at once. The, the French come over and start settling in places like uh, Canada, where what is modern day Montreal and Quebec. And, um, and you have like, uh, you know, uh, God, what's his name now? I'm blanking on his name. <sighs> Excuse me. I don't know why I'm so tired this morning, but uh, French uh, explorer, uh, gosh, Cham Champlain. Champlain. That's the guy that I was trying to think of. And uh, so, you know, uh, Champlain sets up colonies up in northern, uh, northern Canada. Uh, and then the English, their first colony fails at Roanoke, and then they, their first successful colony is at Jamestown, although it was just bare by the hair of their chinny-chin-chin that they were able to get that thing set up. It almost collapsed. That's the story of John Smith and all that sort of stuff, Pocahontas and so on. Um, Sir Francis Drake was a, essentially a privateer who was hired by Elizabeth I at the time to take Spanish silver. He was an important figure of that time. The Netherlands dominated in, uh, they have some areas in the Caribbean, but they dominate mostly in the east. They take over a bunch of the Portuguese uh, settlements in the, in the 1600s during the Dutch Golden Age in the 1640s and 50s. Um, moving down politics, legal link between European crown and their colonial land holdings, the Encomienda system, we talked about that. Audiencias, this is advisory boards, the visory. Um, viceroys or governors with administrative sovereign uh, sovereignty over New Spain. Uh, Encomienda system ends, replaced by the repartimiento system. Uh, they rely increasingly on slave population from Africa. Okay, we talked about that. Uh, Atlantic system, Colombian exchange. We talked about that. Triangular trade system. We talked about that. Transatlantic slavery was uh, abolished in 1807. I knew it was right around there. Uh, exported slaves began in, okay, 1518. 10 million slaves were sold into slavery. Uh, Great Britain had sold half of them into slavery. Um, Middle Passage was the voyage to New World. Okay, commercial ca uh, capitalism. We start to see family-owned banking firms that could no longer keep up with the demand for capital to finance overseas exploration. So we start to see large commercial banks emerge like the Bank of, of the Netherlands or Bank of Amsterdam. 
Mercantilism, we talked a lot about mercantilism today. Uh, new forms of investment were created, like joint stock companies. Remember the Virginia Company or the British East India Company or the Dutch East India Company, uh, uh, where the rich would pool their wealth together. Um, let's see, more wealth felt than ever before, but wealth concentrated in the hands of a very few. So much wealth that Spain endures an inflation crisis from the influx of silver. We talked about that creation of a truly global worldwide market. We talked about that. Uh, also, we see state building during this time, but I'm going to save this for our unit four review. So, so we talked about today the age of exploration. Now, I wanted to jump over here and show you a few other things. Um, you, can always, you can always use these as another way of um, looking through uh, review rivals on the world stage. Um, Treaty of Tordesillas. We haven't yet gotten to the Seven Years' War. This is a little bit ahead of where we're at, to be honest with you. Okay, we're going to jump down here. Uh, what else do we see here? Colombian Exchange, Continental Expansion, major ports at the time. I talked about some of that. Amsterdam, Antwerp, Bristol, London. Um, new plants. Uh, this is the Colombian Exchange. We talked about that, so we can jump down here. Uh, slave trade. Remember that a lot of the coastal... Um, the coastal African communities were making money from slave trade because they were moving to the interior. The coastal wealthy Africans who traded with the Europeans would move into the interior, conquer interior tribal Africans, and then enslave them using the kinds of things that the Europeans had traded them, like weapons and so on. The commercial revolution. Um, we start to see innovations in banking and finance promote the growth of urban financial centers in a more money-based economy at this time. So we are starting to see the introduction of capitalism. So like, for example, we see double entry bookkeeping, the Bank of Amsterdam. Uh, remember, the Bank of England was modeled after that. Uh, joint stock companies like the British East India Company and the, and the Dutch East India Company. Oh, we also see the commercialization of agriculture. We start to see the beginnings of the enclosure movement during this time. Uh, particularly by the end of the uh, 1500s and early 1600s in certain areas like England, uh, restricting the use of the village common areas, freehold tenure, uh, and then um, new economic elites where you have Italian merchant princes, nobles of the robe in France who start to be able to purchase robe titles or, or noble titles. Um, if they are particularly wealthy, but then remember that in France, if they do that, they have to give up their um, they have to give up their privileges for private trade. In England, they don't. Um, we start to see new challenges to um, urban elites, like sanitation problems caused by overpopulation, crime in urban areas, poverty in urban areas in particular, uh, employment issues, uh, and so on. Okay, any other things here that we need to discuss? I think that that covers it. Now, for today's assignment, um, because I already gave you guys questions for this, uh, I am going to change up today's assignment to be something a little bit more basic. Um, just, just as like a... Um, as a, let's see here, as a way to help you with your writing skills. So I'm going to go on Schoology here. Let's do this. Let's go to Schoology. Let's log in here. I am going to create an assignment on Schoology right now. Let's go to here. Let's go to here. Go to here. And make sure I'm not missing any other questions. Do you guys have any questions at this time? If you do, you're welcome to type them out. I'm going to get this thing set up. Okay, so new folder. I 
today is the 13th, I think. Yeah. Add materials. Okay, let's add assignment. Actually, before I add the assignment, let me add this link here really quick. Questions on anything? No one has questions. We got 15 concurrent viewers. Copy URL. Let's put that in here. Live lecture. April 13th. Add. All right. And then now we'll add the assignment. And we're going to jump over here really quick. And I'm going to look up. Actually, I can do it from here. Open a new tab. There we go. Let's do this really quickly, and then we'll go over here, go to URHS, Social Sciences, Miscellaneous. Let's go to, I'm trying to find like something different than just the stupid, dumb AP questions for you this time, something that might be a little bit more practical to your success on the AP exam. AP Euro. We could do, you know what we could do? You know what we haven't done in a while? We could do a hippo. Everybody's favorite assignment. Uh, let's do this. Let's look up this. Let's do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with a DBQ since that's what you're going to be having to do. Let's find a good one. Let's find a good one for you. Do we have one on expiration? Uh, I don't think we do. Yeah, let's see what we can find. I don't know why I'm speaking with an Irish accent. Clearly I'm going nuts. Okay, Reformation DBQ. Hmm. <laughs> Ooh, witches. We didn't talk much about witches. Oh, we'll do that next unit. That's okay. Let's do ooh, 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 this one. Right. Hmm. Click on this. This one has to do with the Protestant Reformation. Maybe we should do this one. You know what? Let's do just that. Well, this is kind of from last review time, but um, doesn't mean it's bad. I just don't really have a... Um, I don't really have a... Uh, what you call it? Pulled up for... I'm limited to only the things that I have on Schoology, which is not all of my files. Normally, on my, I've got tons and tons and tons of files on my computer at work, but I kind of have to like go with what I have here. So we're gonna we're gonna do with what I have at this point, uh, which is at this time a Protestant Reformation DBQ. But I'm not gonna make you do the whole DBQ. Uh, it'll be optional. Obviously, all of it is optional, really. Let me refresh this page really quickly here. All right, so this is called Protestant Reformation, DBQ, religious or political. And um, it's, it's kind of not the best prompt, to be honest with you. There's a reason I didn't use this one in class. It also only has five documents though, which is what you're gonna be given on the AP exam. So you know what, actually, I am gonna have you do a full DBQ on this one because it's only five, only five documents on this. So, um, and then I'm gonna also add for you the rubric so you can use that as you write. 
and um, this will be a good opportunity for you to review some ideas on how to write the DBQ, how to analyze documents and stuff. I feel like that's a more practical way of using this review time that we have before you actually have to take the AP exam because, you know, let's face it, the AP exam is going to be a DBQ of five documents. I feel like it's really good to practice that and um, I'll also create a, an assignment submission thing for you as well. Um, let me add for you though, before I forget, I'm going to add the uh, rubric uh, for 2020 so that you can review that as well. So that's there for you. And then let me go ahead and add this assignment for you. Be writing Mondays. Maybe every Monday we'll do a writing assignment. And then the other ones we'll do something maybe a little less rigorous. So lesson, um, this is going to be um, Protestant Reformation, DBQ. Even though I know we didn't do Protestant Reformation today, I'm going to see if I can find a different one for next time. It doesn't hurt to review it. Protestant Reformation is pretty important stuff for understanding um, the thing. Now, when you, when you do your DBQ, you can just type it into Word and upload a Word document. And, uh, and that will suffice for your assignment. So, um, oh yeah, he just, yeah, he does whatever he wants really. There's no, there's no telling, there's no telling Mochi. He'll just do anything, you know, like it's, he just, yeah, he just is, the, that cat is completely uncontrollable and I don't discipline him because I'm a terrible, terrible cat dad. Uh, Mochi. Okay. Come here. You're blameless. You know that? You know you're perfect? You know you're perfect in every single way and you've never done anything wrong in your entire life? I think he does know. Okay. Now. Uh... Protestant Reformation DBQ. I am really getting sick of these gardeners out there because they're making a lot of noise and it's really, really annoying. Um, let's see here. Protestant Reformation DBQ. That's good to go. Now I need to copy this over to the other classes so that other folks have access to it. Copy to courses. That, that, copy folder. All right, very good. Did I come up with, <laughs> Mochi does have chaotic energy. Um, did I come up with my cat's names? I did, yeah. So I used to have a cat years and years and years ago named Ringo. Ringo after Ringo Starr of the Beatles. And, um, or Johnny Ringo, the, um, bad guy from the movie Tombstone. But, um, <laughs> and, um, so, uh, Ringo ended up having a very serious problem, genetic illness. And so I had to put him down. And, uh, Harrison was the cat that I got after Ringo. Mochi just was so sweet. I just, Mochi's like a little lover, and so, well, he is to me, not to anyone else. Mochi and I have a very special connection, but yeah, it just was one of those things where, um, I don't know, they, their names are kind of wacky, but, but they fit them perfectly in a weird way. So, um, any questions on what you have to do here? Basically, it's just a practice DBQ. Time yourself. Uh, I recommend timing yourself. This will give you some good practice on typing, too. So, um, that's another thing that, again, I really strongly recommend uh, is, is practice typing because the faster and more accurately that you type, the less you have to worry about it. Do all the things that you're supposed to do with the DBQ. Analyze the documents. Um, take notes on the documents, know, have an outline ready to go before you actually start writing it. You want to know what your thesis statement is. You want to know what you're going to use for the context before your thesis statement. 
you want to make sure that you have a t uh, proper, uh, you know, POV statements and CAP statements understood before you even start writing it. These are the sorts of things that are going to going to be most beneficial to you when you actually do start writing your um, your your DBQ, okay, on online. So. Um, this will conclude our lesson for today. It took us about an hour and a half to get through all this stuff. Um, I might do the DBQ on my phone because I type way faster. Hey, if that's if that works for you, that's fine. Um, I don't know if that's recommended either. I, I think you can do it on a phone or on a tablet device or whatever. I, I don't think it necessarily matters. I think that all those options will be available to you. But, um, but just, you know, hey, as long as it's, uh, as long as you're doing it as fast as you can, I think is probably the best, the best route. So I don't want to necessarily recommend that, uh, to do it on your phone. I, I would always prefer to do it at a computer personally, but if you feel like you're going to do it better at your phone, then, then, um, then I'll, I'll, I'll let you make that decision for yourself. So that'll be on you. So anyhow, folks, well, if that, um, if that brings us to the end for today, um, then I think that that'll be it. Um, if you have any other questions, of course, feel free to shoot me a message on uh, Schoology and I'll see if I can handle it. I'm trying to add late work, um, but you know, hey, uh, not all late work is going to get added just by the nature of things because I, I don't have access to certain things that I need and, and some of the late work is not even in this, you know, digitally submitted. It's, it's, uh, so anyway, it, it, not all late work is going to get added. I'm, I'm trying to make my way through, but it's really, really, really hard to do it remotely. So anyhow, I'm um, doing the best I can, but if you have any other questions on things other than late work or absent work, on review or whatever else, of course, feel free to reach out because uh, I'm here and I'll be able to, to answer your questions at basic, basically at any time. So you can just send me a message on Schoology. Anyway, folks, I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm going to get ready to do the uh, regular world history lesson. And um, yeah, take care.